The ideas I would like to share with you today are not my own. They are, I attribute them, they, they, they actually um, were given to me, I think, by, uh, by some of the most remarkable people, people that I've had the opportunity to work with over the past 27 years. I was recruited in 1990 to go to work for Anasazi Foundation by Dr. C. Terry Warner, Professor of Philosophy at Brigham Young University. And I have my clipper down here. Terry um, had, was a philosopher, as many of you know, and he had studied with some of the most significant philosophers in the world, trying to solve a problem known as self-deception. It was a personal quest at first for him, trying to solve some of his own interpersonal struggles. Um, but soon, he, as he began to put his ideas together, he would share them with his colleagues, with students, and, and small groups of people. And people would come to his sessions, and the results were remarkable. People who had struggled for many, many years trying to self-regulate negative emotions and, and, uh, and destructive behaviors suddenly found the power to be able to turn their lives around and, uh, and get them on track. Terry, um, was, uh, uh, the only way I can describe Terry Warner is, is in those early days as he would share his material and content with people is he was really quiet. He didn't draw a lot of attention to himself. Um, he just quietly shared this material and content with him. In 1989, he was teaching a workshop at Brigham University at Education Week. And at, in the back of the room happened to be Larry Olson and Ezekiel Sanchez, the two founders of Anasazi Foundation. And they were quite fascinated by the things that Terry was sharing with them. So after the class, they went up, they visited with Terry, and they invited him to come and visit their program. Told him a little about what they were doing at Anasazi. And he was just curious enough to load up his family, take them down in that same year, 1989, uh, Thanksgiving, to go and visit Anasazi and see what they were about. And he went out on the trail, visited the young people, visited staff who were with them, interviewed parents and children, people who participated in the program, and he fell in love with their work. He felt like it was his life's work in action, what he saw at Anasazi. He was fascinated by it. And he vowed to do anything he could to ensure that Anasazi was going to be around many years from now to help. That's how I got here, and that's how Sterling Tanner, my partner, my right here, got, got here. We, we, we came um, at that effort to help Anasazi. Um, move its mission forward. Well, Terry had, uh, um, in, in, his, in his quest to try and help Anasazi, um, he and Anasazi was just small and just starting off. It was getting going. He mentored and worked with us closely during those early years of the development of Anasazi's program. And we're, uh, we're all benefactors of that. Many of us here are benefactors of the work that, that Terry Warner has given to us um, and, and the work that we do. Now, Terry had discovered that, that self-deception was a consequence. It was a consequence of an act contrary to a responsibility we feel towards ourselves and towards others. So, for example, we all have a sense about how we ought to treat ourselves, what things would be harmful to us. We have a sense about those things that would be right for other people. We have a sense about how we want to be treated if we were in their circumstances. Honor that sense and life flows. Betray that sense and we create a variance in our lives, a variance that we now have to explain away, we now have to justify, we now have to make right. And let me give you a simple example of that. When Gailey and I, before we were married, um, I would go on long runs with her. We would go on runs, and, and, uh, and then we got married, and I stopped running altogether. And, uh, and when, when she asked me about it, I, I would say, you know, look, I, um, I'm busy. I mean, class, all the things coming up, things that are going on. And in that first year of marriage, I gained 30 pounds. 30 pounds. When people would ask me about it, I would say, well, my metabolism just stopped. Right? right, right. It just completely stopped. Or it was the cookies she made. She only makes cookies almost every day. And, uh, and, and I would try to explain it away. Well, several years ago, my brother passed away with a heart attack. Two years younger than me. And it was an unwitnessed death, and so there was a, a it was an autopsy done, and the coroner called, and my sister-in-law asked if I would get on the phone with her when the coroner called. And the first words out of the coroner's mouth was, does he have any siblings? And, and I, she said yes, and he says they need to get checked immediately, immediately. So I went in, got checked, and the doctor sat down with me after 
my, my physical and said, Mike, unless you change some of your habits, um, you're going to have a similar fate as your brother. So I came back and I changed. I changed. I, I started eating a little differently. Um, I, I started exercising, but it didn't last very long. Maybe a few weeks before I fell right back into the same old behavior. Well, this time I had to go a little bit deeper. This time I had to go a little deeper with my justification. And, uh, and so when people would ask me about it, I'd say, with all that's on my plate, there's no way, no way I have time to exercise. And uh, if, if Gailey was to ask me about it, I, I'd say, well, look, I, um, <laughs> I'd say, I, I, you just, you'd love me if I look like Tom Cruise, right? And so you, that you'd love me then. And, uh, and, and then I'd tell myself, Mike, you know what? maybe it'd be okay if you had a heart attack. Then, then, then she could find a Tom Cruise. And uh, so it was as if I put on darkened glasses. And I said, now begin to see myself and others in a way that made it okay when you have this variance in my life. And uh, in, in self-fulfilling ways, in a strange kind of way, I needed other people to see me um, in particular ways, to give me a hard time about it, to mistreat me and not see all the work that I did. I needed to, to be unappreciated. I needed to be overwhelmed. I needed to be in a space where I couldn't control this, right? That's what made it okay. It was an insatiable need. And this view that I had now created of myself in the world, I had to sustain it. In order for me to sustain it, I had to feed it. And so I would read books in a way that would justify me. I would, <laughs> I would uh, uh, listen to talk tapes in a way that justify me. I would, I would have conversations with other people in a way that would justify me, that would make it okay, that variance okay. It became this insatiable need. When, when we have this need to be justified, we're willing to put at risk our success. We're willing to put at risk our happiness. Look, we'd rather be just right or right than happy, right? We're willing to put all that ahead of it. And, uh, and to, to feed this, to feed this. It's, it's an addiction. It's actually the deepest addiction that we all have. We all have, to some degree, those variants in our lives we have to justify. It's the addiction that makes possible all our other addictions. And this, the, 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 the thought pattern that goes through that, the obsessions that we have during that period of time, the stories we have to tell ourselves to make our, to account for the variances in our lives, right? So, well, what was it that Terry Warner saw when he went to Ansazi um, that, uh, that, that, that fascinated him so much, that made him want to do all he could to help Ansazi move forward? Well, Larry and Ezekiel, um, who many of you know, founders, pioneers of uh, wilderness therapy, had, uh, had, had started on Sazi, well actually started taking young people and students out many, many years ago um, in the late 60s at Brigham University. Their early programming was just simple day-to-day -day walking on the land where people would go out on the trail and they would survive. And, uh, and in small groups, it was a simple walking on the land and, uh, when they were out there. And, and in, in 1969, they won an award, a National Education Award for Youth Rehabilitation Through Outdoor Survival. When that happened, the university rolled out the red carpet. They got all kinds of resources they could apply towards their work. And they, they, they gained the interest of the academic community, the therapeutic community, who then began to try and build on what they had started and what they were trying to do. And so they, uh, they came in, they piloted all kinds of things to enhance the work and build on what they've done. Things like trust games and sensitivity training and, 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 and high adventure activities that they've been put into it. Well, after many years of experimenting on this, Larry and Ezekiel um, came, made a, a basic discovery, a simple basic discovery. And that discovery was that those that young people responded best, responded best, to those, to, to this simple kind of walking with people who are not trying to fix any change in them, who are simply on the journey with them. That simple walking on the line with people who weren't trying to fix and change in them, who were just on the journey with them, right? Well, they, that's evident by their, uh, their core beliefs that they established when they came to Anasazi. I want to share with you just a couple of the things that they wrote shortly after founding Anasazi. They wrote a document on their core beliefs. And I want to share a couple of thoughts to you from this. It says, We believe in the making of a trustee in each young walker. That's what they call the young people who participate in the program. 
This is done by respecting and protecting each young person's agency and dignity. We feel that each child is a person of worth and is inherently good from the first moments on the trail. This is exemplified without intimidations. We believe that the wilderness is not a harsh place to be conquered, but a place in which each young person may walk in harmony with others and his own surroundings. Though trail life is hard and nature demands the very best from a person, it is not adversarial, nor is it cruel. The leaders and the young people walk side by side through the challenges and difficulties of life in the wilderness. It is a quiet place which grants time to think and ponder without the need for contrived experiences or high adventures. We believe that all young people respond best to patient love and, the, and that the principles taught by the Creator provide ample opportunities for growth of love and respect between all peoples. We therefore strive to exemplify those principles daily in the in, on the trail by patiently waiting for young people to respond to their own awakenings and, their, and the good teachings. We strive not to judge nor manipulate nor reject people in any way. And so they use this, this document that they put together as a framework for the development of all of their curriculum, for the framework of the development of, of all their interventions, their, um, the, their ceremonies, everything they did in that was focused on the greatness of a child, focused on their value, on their worth. Ezekiel would say within every child was a seed of greatness, right? A seed of greatness. And that was the focus. That was the focus. And so, again, what does Terry Warner see when he came to Avasazi? Without knowing it, Larry and Ezekiel had created an environment free from justification. Free from justification. Where young people didn't have anywhere to go with it. And so what Terry witnessed when he came to Avasazi was that a young person could go yell at a staff member, but a staff member was too busy looking for their greatness. And so they would say, wow, I love your voice. Do you sing? Right? And uh, yes, a young person could go pound on a tree, but the tree didn't pound back. They could write a nasty letter home, but it took a whole week to get a letter back. And when they got that letter back, it was a letter of a seed of greatness letter, where a parent was writing the greatness they saw in their child. And it was a letter of apology, a letter of love. So here was a child left to stand before their own conscience in the face of those who really cared about them. And what's possible in that space, right? What's possible in that space? Well, they're left to be responsible for their life, for their choices, right? Now, several years ago, I was on a plane, and, uh, and I met a young man sitting next to me who had participated in the NATSAP program. And we were on the plane together. I asked him, I said, tell me about your program, or about your experience. And he talked about it for a while. And I said, what did you love before you went to the program? He says, I, I love drugs. I love everything about drugs. I said, wow, why? He says, because everyone is trying to take them away from me. And so he says, I was obsessed with it. That's all I thought about, right? It, 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 every thought, how was I going to get it? And, and why I needed it? And I said, well, what do you love now? And he was now a dad, three little ones of his own. He said, I love my family. I love my family. I said, what changed for you? And he says, well, he says, when I went to that program, I discovered that I was somebody. I was somebody. And that this was my life. And I was responsible for it. And that's what enabled me to leave it behind. I'll never forget one time someone asked Ezekiel, well, why don't you send an impact letter out to your, and have the parents write an impact letter first to the children on the trail? And Ezekiel said, well, an impact letter just tells them all the reasons why they need to be there, which just gives them all the reasons why they shouldn't be there, right? And so, the focus is on greatness. It's on that seed of greatness. Seed of greatness. Now, if you, in your life, in your path, and you're those you care and work for here at that stuff, come across someone who's obsessed with blame, who's willing to continue behaviors, negative behaviors, regardless of the adverse consequences of those behaviors, pretty good chance they have a variance in their life they're trying to justify. They're trying to make okay. And, and they have that insatiable need. They're honed in on hypocrisies. They need you to be bad, right? In order to make that okay. 
And in subtle ways, we often give that to them, without even knowing we give that to them. And uh, the only power we have over others to change them is the kind of person we give them to respond to. Right? And so, see them as an object to be fixed or changed. See them as a problem, or neglect their needs in favor of our own. And we simply give them the justifications they seek and keep them stuck. See them as a person with worth, with value, who counts like we count, with greatness. And we change their world. We completely change their world. And it's only in that space that they can see their lives truthfully. Now, there's no guarantee they'll change in that space. But it's the best chance they will. That's the best chance they will. And so I often, when I get older, the more I realize the subtle ways in which I give other people justification. The subtle ways I let people off the hook from being responsible. And, uh, and that's become my quest to improve and be better. I don't want to do that. Because look, if it's true of me that I, I need justification to, 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 to justify the variances in my life, it's true of them. <laughs> and I'm either helping or hindering them to that effort. I don't want to help them in that effort because it keeps them stuck. I'd rather give them somebody different to respond to. So what if my focus, what if I can focus more on people's greatness than on my own justifications? What kind of influence would I have then? What kind of influence would we have if we were intentional about it? If that's what we, that's what we focused on was greatness, what kind of influence could we have then? When I think about my own experience in life, and I think about the people that I've been moved by, the people that have moved me somewhere where um, to improve, to grow, to be something that I wasn't at the time, it's been those people who have seen greatness in me. It's been those people. Think about your own experience, the people you'd run the, through the wall for, the people that you would be, um, that, that you were changed by. How do they most often see you? As a person who counted like they counted? Someone of worth? Or an object to be fixed or changed? So now, I'm going to share a couple of stories, a couple of simple stories. When I was, when I was in sixth grade, not, well, it was a little over sixth grade, when I, when I, yeah, sixth grade, when I first tried out for the basketball team, I wanted to play basketball. I loved basketball, and I learned how to do a layup from a neighbor kid, and I wanted to play basketball. I tried out for the basketball team, and I was cut the first day. I tried out for the basketball team when I was in seventh grade, I was cut the first day. I tried out for basketball in eighth grade, I was cut the first day. I tried out for basketball in ninth grade, a freshman in high school, 4'11". I was 4'11". <laughs> I tried out for basketball team. The first day I didn't get cut. <coughs> Next day I didn't get cut. Third day, I was on the team. I had made the team. I was on the freshman B squad, Deer Park, Washington basketball team. I was a stag. That's what they call us. But that was our mascot. And so I had made the team. Well, little did I know, and Coach Wagner, Coach Wagner, every year, picked one boy who wouldn't have otherwise ever made the team to join the team. And he did it for a couple reasons. One, obviously, was for the boy. The other reason he did it was because he knew that he could use it to motivate the team, right? And so he'd tell the team, look, if we get 10 points up, we get to throw merch in Right? So, so they, all right, we get up there, we get up there. When, when they get 10 points up, they throw a merchant in. And it was always about, get merchant the ball, get in the ball. And when I got the ball and I made a basket, I mean, the whole, the whole bench just went up. And we, they were so excited. Right? Well, at the end of the year, at the, the, the banquet, the basketball banquet, I was given a trophy. Most improved player, right, at the end of the year. And it was, to me, it was the greatest thing. A little Fort Lauderdale. I had been on the team, I had contributed. Coach Wagner had seen greatness in me, right? Well, let's fast forward many, many years from there. Well, three years after my brother passed away, um, Gailey and I were in California together. And uh, we, we had had a wonderful day together, and that evening we were together. She looks over me and says, Mike, I don't know anyone who does more good than you, but I'm worried about you. I'm worried about you. And I want you to be around for a while. And at that moment, 
I decided I wanted to take better care of myself. I wanted to exercise and change my diet. And uh, those of you that know me, I have my mobile every morning, right? And I exercise, I don't look like it, but I exercise every day I can, right? And so I change because Gaylene saw greatness in me. My children are who they are because Gaylene sees greatness in them. She sees greatness in them. Terry Warner once said this. He said, our love will indict their spirit. Whereas our blame will only console them. That makes sense? Our love will indict their spirit. Whereas our blame will only console them. So it's my hope, it's my hope for all of us, that we won't let the greatness of anyone in our path go unnoticed. There's greatness in this room. Amazing greatness. I am so grateful for the opportunity that I've had to be associated with the greatness in this room. Wonderful people that are here. And so thank you. Thank you for this honor. And thank you for the great and wonderful work that all of you do. Thank you very much.